Did you know that we're closer in time to the famous Queen Cleopatra than she was to the time when the Great Pyramids were built? Almost 3,000 years of recorded history precedes this famous queen, but how do we make sense of this huge expanse of time? What terminology do we use? What exactly is a dynasty? And what the heck is an intermediate period? Well, stay tuned, because that's what we'll be talking about today. Welcome to the Dead Speak Online, where we demystify the words and lives of the ancient Egyptians through animated videos like this one. If you're new here, consider subscribing. Having received communication from the royal palace in Alexandria, Manitho wonders what's in store for him. Originally from the Delta, Manitho is a priest of the sun god Ray and a very educated man. He soon learns that the king, Ptolemy II, is commissioning him to write a full history of Egypt, a feat that has never been undertaken in his country's almost 3,000 years of recorded history. And the history that Manitho writes better make Ptolemy II look good by linking him to the illustrious pharaohs of Egypt's past. Since such an undertaking has never been done before, Manitho must scour the temple and palace archives to find the records that he'll need to reconstruct his country's history. And since the king, Ptolemy II, is of Greek Macedonian heritage, and he conducts all of his government business in Greek, Manitho will also be writing his history in Greek, rather than in Egypt's native language. It is to Manitho and his history of Egypt that we owe a great deal of our understanding of ancient Egyptian chronology, as well as some of the conventions that we still use for dividing up ancient Egyptian history. While Manitho's original work does not actually survive in full, we do have parts of it because it was quoted by later authors. Unfortunately, these later authors sometimes disagree on what Manitho actually wrote. However, despite these problems, Manitho's history of Egypt still holds great influence over how we talk about ancient Egyptian history today. But how was Manitho to make sense of Egyptian chronology? The ancient Egyptians didn't write dates the way that we do, with the year number continually increasing every year. Instead, they dated things by a king's reign. When a new king came to the throne, let's say Tutmosa, that year was called Year One under Tutmosa. And let's say Tutmosa ruled for about 20 years and died in his final year, which was the 21st year, that year would be called Year 21 under Tutmosa. And then when the next king came to the throne, we'd start all over again as year one under whatever that king's name was. If we were to use a similar system for dating in the United States, based on who is president, instead of saying 1962, we would say year two under President Kennedy. And instead of saying 1981, we would say year one under President Reagan. At his disposal, Manitho must have had a number of lists of kings that were in chronological order some of which even survive today. However, these lists can be inconsistent. Sometimes they include certain kings, other times they exclude them. To make sense of the potential chaos of all of these kings' reigns, Manitho decided to come up with a system of grouping them into dynasties. So you may have heard terms like 18th dynasty or dynasty four in the past, and that's because modern scholars have actually adopted this system from Manitho's history of Egypt. So what is a dynasty? Perhaps you've only heard the term dynasty in relation to the 1980s television show of that name. Or perhaps you know it from sports, because sports teams are sometimes called a dynasty if they've won multiple championships in only a few years. Alternatively, if you're a history buff, which seems more likely since you're watching this video, you might know the term from reading about, for example, the Han Dynasty of China, the Bourbon Dynasty of France, or the Tudor Dynasty of England. When we talk about these historical dynasties of both the East and West, we're usually referring to an unbroken family line of rulers, usually a kingship that passed from father to son. However, Manitho apparently didn't ascribe to the same definition of dynasty, and sometimes it can be really tricky to figure out why he divided up history the way that he did. Some of his lists of rulers that he put into dynasties, such as Dynasty 12, do follow this convention. In the case of Dynasty 12, we have a continuous line of rulers from father to son for seven kings in a row, and then one final female ruler who was also a member of the same family. 
After this, Manetho starts over with the next dynasty, Dynasty 13. The first king of this dynasty, as far as we can tell, was not related to Dynasty 12, so this makes sense with our traditional idea of what a dynasty is. However, with some of the other kings of ancient Egyptian history, it can be a real mystery why Manetho either divided them into more than one dynasty or combined them into one dynasty. Let's take, for example, Dynasties 17 and 18. The last king of Dynasty 17 and the first king of Dynasty 18 were actually brothers, and they're sons of the previous king. Yet Manetho still divides them into two dynasties, 17 and 18. On the flip side, the first couple of kings of the 18th dynasty appear to be completely unrelated to the kings that then follow them in that dynasty. Yet Manetho still considered them one dynasty, Dynasty 18. Instead of following strict family lines, it seems that sometimes Manetho divided dynasties based on historical and political changes, such as the reunification of Egypt after a time when it had been politically divided. Sometimes Manetho also grouped kings into dynasties based on the fact that they ruled from the same capital city. However, there are many occasions where, from the sources that we have, we can't make out any reason at all why Manetho would divide or combine kings into a dynasty. Over top of Manetho's dynasty system, scholars of the past couple of centuries have come up with a series of period names to use. So for example, Dynasty 18 through Dynasty 20 is called the New Kingdom. Now these divisions and these period names are made up based on our understanding of when Egypt was politically unified, that is, when the entire country was ruled by one king and his administration. The series of names that scholars use for when the country was unified under one king are called the Early Dynastic Period, the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, the New Kingdom, and the Late Period. Now when the country was divided, scholars usually call those times intermediate periods. So we have the First Intermediate Period, the Second Intermediate Period, and, you guessed it, the Third Intermediate Period. While scholars of today do see many problems with these conventions, they still continue to use them, largely out of convenience and so that everybody in Egyptology can actually understand each other when they talk about various time periods. So it makes sense to us when one person says early New Kingdom and another person says 18th Dynasty. Now you might be thinking, wouldn't it just be easier to use absolute dates like 1455 BC by simply counting backwards through the king's reigns or by comparing historical events in ancient Egypt to those of neighboring cultures that have more secure chronology? The short answer would be, well, there, there really is no short answer, other than no or it's complicated. But here's the almost short answer. Because the ancient Egyptian evidence that still survives today is spotty, their system of dating things by king's reign makes it particularly difficult to pinpoint anything with an absolute date like we're used to doing for the last couple hundred years of history. Complicating things even further is that sometimes more than one king actually ruled at the same time, so you can't just simply count backwards through the king's reigns. Since the ancient Egyptians did not use a system of continuous year dates the way that, say, the Maya did, for example, we continue to use this system of what we call relative chronology. That is, history is put in chronological order with periods relative to other periods, but without any fixed absolute dates. In this way, though we may not have an exact date for a particular event or a particular period, we do know where it falls in Egyptian history in relation to other events and other periods, thus the term relative chronology. Now this is not to say that we have no idea at all when things happened in relation to absolute dates. Through archaeological sequencing techniques, comparing historical events from different cultures, ancient records of astronomical observations, and also modern carbon dating techniques, we do have at a bare minimum at least a ballpark idea of when each king's reign was. But because there is some wiggle room in these dates, oftentimes when you read different books and websites, you'll see different dates for different king's reigns. For example, the Wikipedia entry for King Pepe I lists his reigning years as 2332 through 2287 BC. 
while the book Ancient Egypt by Salima Ikram lists the dates for the same king as 2343 through 2297 BC. However, you can see from this example that even as far back as Dynasty VI, that is, over 4,000 years ago, the difference in possible interpretations of the dates is actually still quite small, and we only get more precise as time goes on. So where do some of the most famous monuments and famous rulers fall within this relative chronology? Well, many of the most famous kings fall within what we call the New Kingdom. For example, we have the female king Hatshepsut, the so-called heretic Akhenaten, both of whom ruled during the 18th dynasty, or what we would call also the early New Kingdom. In addition, we have Ramses II, who is sometimes called Ramses the Great, largely because of the huge number of statues of himself that he left behind, and he ruled for an incredibly long time during what we call the 19th dynasty, which is around the middle of the New Kingdom. Much earlier in Egyptian history, the Great Pyramids of Giza, the most famous pyramids that is, were built during the 4th dynasty, or what would also be the early Old Kingdom. If we go all the way to the other end of the spectrum, Cleopatra VII, that is the famous Cleopatra, ruled at the end of what we call the Ptolemaic period. Now you probably noticed that I haven't mentioned this period before, and that's because it falls outside of Manetho's dynasty system. And that is because Manetho actually lived during this period. He lived around the beginning of what we call the Ptolemaic period, and so he didn't include it in his history of Egypt as a particular dynasty. This period is called the Ptolemaic period because all of the men in Cleopatra's family, that is, the people who were actually kings during this time, were all named Ptolemy. Now if we look at an illustration of the time from the earliest pharaohs all the way to today, we can see that where Cleopatra falls is actually closer to us than she was to the Great Pyramids of Giza. While the ways we have of dividing up ancient Egyptian history and the terminology that we use for doing so can be confusing and can even introduce other problems, they're still the best tools that we have for discussing and making sense of this very long and fascinating time. Perhaps at some point in the future, Egyptologists will agree on a new set of terms, but I'm not gonna hold my breath. Getting everybody, or even just a majority, to agree on a new set of terms would probably be akin to trying to herd cats. If you're interested in learning more about ancient Egypt, make sure to check out my other videos and also take a look in the description below where I've included a list of books that I recommend on ancient Egyptian history and chronology. If you've enjoyed this video, do give it a thumbs up, and to make sure that you don't miss future videos like this one, hit that subscribe button. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.